when I pull up the email you sent, you had a section on how to succeed. You need to do something. You put do in capitals. Yes. You need to keep trying. It takes time. You need to plan. So you want to talk about success? How do you succeed? Yes. Let's talk a little bit about success. And, um, you know, we've kind of been actually dancing around it a little bit because people are, you know, people ask, well, how do I get clients? How do I have a solid business? And to me, that's success. And success to me is not, um, well, I mean, absolutely, if you're a, a famous musician, a high-paid athlete, Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, you, know, <laughs> there's, you know, there's that level of success, but I think we tend to forget that just running a good, solid business that takes care of you and your family, that's success as well. And, you know, I, I think people tend to forget that, and one of my... One of the things that I've seen, and, and this is not just in the massage community, but in a larger community as well, people want success, but they're not willing to do anything about it. And, uh, you know, that, that whole thing, yeah, as soon as I hear that, my heart drops. They want success, but they don't want to do anything. Yeah. And you, you want to accomplish, so, whatever your goal is. I want to be on a beach in Jamaica. But to accomplish that, you have to do something. Yeah. I don't want to do anything. I mean, that just seems, you're going to be sitting on the couch doing nothing, watching Netflix. I mean, yeah. you want to succeed. I mean, and people's, I guess, definitions of that vary, but... Yeah, and well, and that's just it. Success is, is a personal definition. You know, sometimes success is, hey, you know, I need to bring in 10, 10 extra, or 10,000 10, extra dollars a month, or a month. <laughs> we would all like 10,000 extra dollars a month, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, a year to help with the, fi the family finances. Um, so that's success, whereas there are others, you know, want to make 500000 or run a million dollar business, something like that. So you have to first define what success is for you, and then you got to figure out how to get there. You wouldn't have the success, uh, I consider you successful, because you, you have your... Um, See, I'm like, I'm totally not successful, but it depends <laughs> but on how you measure. you have a personal practice that is taking care of your bills, you have your CE practice where you're, you know, you're out there teaching classes. No, you're, no, you don't sell them all out and every once in a while you got to cancel a few, but this is, this is life when you're growing. But, you know, you've made a lot of success. You've told me, you know, you've, you're pretty much debt free, except you're paying off your house now. Yeah, so, you know, you got the mortgage, but all your other debts you paid off. So now this is success to me. He's making progress. But if you had stayed where you were what, about six years ago, yeah, crying in your crying in your garden, <laughs> so, crying and being Amish, yes, yeah. making combos, yeah. You know, um, you wouldn't be where you are today, and we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. So when you look back and think of all the steps you had to do, but the first thing you had to do was do something. You had to take that first yeah. step. People, somebody asked Susan Lancaster on the Massage Entrepreneurs Group. I'll include a link to the group down below. She asked today, "How do you measure success? Ah. What does success look like to you?" And what is your vision of a successful business? Which touches on the same thing we're discussing. Yes, perfect. Susan. When I started, I remember this succinctly. I used to sit around when I was gardening because I didn't want to focus on business at all. Business was not why I got involved in massage. I yeah, got involved in most, massage because I had a, are like that, pain. Yeah. I had a mm -hmm. car accident. Yeah. I wasn't interested in business at all. I was interested in the art of like, I can make people feel better. Yay, I can make people feel better. Like I can use touch, uh, nurturing intimacy to help people make them feel better in a medical way. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's wonderful, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's actually something that's fairly easy to sell, to market, but I didn't know that. What I used to think was, massage is manual labor. It's not digging a ditch. No. But it is manual labor. Yeah. Why can I not make as much money as a plumber? Mm. That was what I literally thought about. I, uh, a plumber would come to my home and replace my hot water heater. After we had purchased the hot water heater, it was like $800 to $1,200. Right. Then he would charge me $400 to change some pipes and do something. It would take him like 45 minutes. He made $400? 
And you'd go, well, why didn't I solder the pipes and do it all myself? It's like, because I don't know how, and I don't have the right. equipment. And it's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to have a, a heart attack and you know die young if I have to figure this out. Right. Because I can, I can intellectually figure it out, yes, but that plumber has done that time again and again and again and again and again. He, the reason it only takes him 45 minutes is because he's a master of his craft. Exactly. We're paying him for his expertise because we don't want him hanging out at our house all day long because we need hot water. Yeah. <laughs> I need hot water now. I need to take a shower, right? And, and you don't want the plumbers going, okay, well, I think I have yeah. to attach this here, you know. Yeah, you don't want that then, guy. <laughs> oops, a uh, uh, pipe broke. Now there's water flooding through your house. That's yeah. what you pay him for, right? Mm -hmm. That $400 is his expertise. Yep. And he doesn't have any problem looking at me with a straight face and being like, hey, that's $400. Yeah. And value. Yep. If a plumber makes $80,000 a year, and I don't know what the going rate is for plumbers in various regions, why can't a massage therapist make $80,000? We work on people's bodies. Yeah. It's manual labor. Mm -hmm. You have to have a license. It's skilled trade. That was my initial sort of gold seal of like what success was. Mm -hmm. You weren't rich, but plumbers were a respected profession in a way that I felt massage for some reason was not. Massage didn't seem to be respected. If you, if you went to a party and you were a plumber, it was like, ooh, he's a plumber. Mm. Like he made, plumbers make good money, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. But I never heard people talk about massage therapists that way. Right, yeah. Why? That is a good question. Why? And, and that was something that just kind of sat in my craw because when you worked for an establishment, and you and I both have our own businesses, so we can say this pretty easily. Did you ever work for a spa or anything? I, I did. I worked for one of the major chains. So. Yeah. And Briefly. <laughs> what, what I noticed when I worked at spas, maybe the first 10 years or so that I worked, uh, it's been like 14 years now total, uh, but for the first 10 or so years, was I never understood why people kept coming into this place and getting a massage with me when they could just come to me directly. But they came to this place. But why doesn't the consumer just cut out the middleman and come directly to me and I make twice as much per hour? I didn't understand that. The plumber, for instance, the plumber didn't go through a middleman that hooks me up with the plumber. I talked to the plumber directly on the phone and he says, yeah, I, uh, I've got some time tomorrow afternoon, I can make it out after four. Why do consumers not go directly to the therapist? Trust value. Trust. Yeah. Comfortable because, value. Because yeah. It's, a, it's a personal service. Yeah. And the thing is, the plumber is working on your plumbing, but how much more intimate is it to have more on you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and the massage industry is. Yeah, I always think about this. This is one of the weirdest industries because you meet somebody for the first time, you talk for a few minutes, and then, well, in your case, they're staying clothed. In my case, you got people undressing, you yeah. know, and it's, you know, so yeah, if you don't know that person, if you don't feel comfortable with them, you know, yeah, you're going to go somewhere where, okay, there's a lot of people around, it looks more professional, it has, you yes. know, things that, and it, it's that feeling of safety. And that is where, in my experience, I think massage envy wins. Because Massage Envy was able to build an empire on inexpensive massage so that massage was no longer a luxury. Mm -hmm. Massage became a very common commodity and it became something that was just part of a normal, healthy lifestyle where you take care of yourself. And they had a nice, clean facility with therapists that you knew were licensed. And that model has spread across the landscape, much to the frustration of many massage therapists. But what I often point out is the people who own Massage Envy are not massage therapists. No. But guess what they are really good at? Business and marketing. Business. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing. Massage therapists in our industry will say, why don't massage therapists run these big businesses? And I'll say, because massage therapists aren't good at business. Yeah. And the thing is, they're different skills. Yeah. They're completely different skills. I really feel like I'm hitting the sweet spot in my career currently between the two. Between being good enough at business and good enough at the art to make everything go forward. Yeah. When you measure success, most people, in my experience, are going to measure it by spreadsheets and money. That, that is initially, the plumber. 
what I wanted to do was like, man, a plumber can make like sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year at least, right? Mm -hmm. So that was like my benchmark for what success was. Once you start to make income, you start to realize, well, I need a new car because I can't have a car that breaks down, cost me more money. Okay, I don't want to rent, I want to buy. Then you own a home and then you have a more and then you gotta pay for repairs. So the money doesn't factor the same way. So yeah. for instance, right now, if millions of dollars showed up in my bank account, I don't know that I necessarily feel more successful. And I realized a long time ago that for me, the money is a way that some people keep score. Mm -hmm. It is a way that some people measure success. Yeah. But I started to realize, my, my wife would talk about this, because if you ask me, I'm broke. And I guarantee you when I have $100,000 in my bank account, I'm going to say, oh, I'm broke. I can't <laughs> and, afford And then I'll slap them for you. And I, can't, I can't afford that bottle of scotch. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. No, we'll go with the $20 bottle or whatever it is. Because I tend to be a spendthrift. I'm very tight with money, mm -hmm. generally. I don't waste it. And what I also notice is, I think for me, it was never really about the money. You're right. The, the biggest joy, the biggest joy to me was creation. Mm. And what I saw in myself was, just like you're an artist, um, if you gave me paint tonight, because it would be very good at first because I'm just not a very good uh, visual artist. Right. But if I practiced each day and got better and better and better, and you could chart that progression two years down the road, you'd go, whoa, look at what you created. Yeah. That was what got me going in business. It was, uh, I found a quote that said that uh, entrepreneurship is the last refuge of the troublemaker. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Because every job I ever had, the owner was just like, what is wrong with you? There is just something wrong with your brain. You can't just follow directions. And I would always go, well, why do we do it that way? That's dumb. We can do it this way. Because I was always looking for like almost this like entrepreneurial angle. Now, no, none of my teachers, none of my employers ever looked at that and tried to harness it. Because they all said, listen, you're a kid, you don't know anything, you're you know, wet behind the ears, just do what we tell you to do. And I was always looking for the angle. So I worked in a health food store. When I worked in the health food store, they made hummus out of a box. I was revolted. So I said, listen, we've got chickpeas, we've got lemons, we've got tahini, we've got garlic, olive oil. And I was a vegetarian at the time. I loved cooking, still love cooking. And I made, started making the hummus from scratch. Hummus sales went through the roof. Yeah. The people who came to the health food store was like, oh my God, they, they were buying packages of hummus. But the boss never came out and said, listen, you did such a great job. You innovated our workplace. I want to give you a special assignment in the kitchen. I'm going to move you from the front desk just dealing with sales. I want you to make specialty items for the kitchen. Right. And looking back, that was exactly what he should have done. Yeah. You know, he put me in a position where what? I could be creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I could produce something people wanted. He was actually making profit. He was drawing yeah. people. But yeah, the thing your creativity is, could have increased his bottom line. Yeah. Because his, his, his business was spreadsheets. Yeah. And how much of this do we sell? And how much do we make per unit? And that wasn't what I was interested in at all. Right. Yeah. So keeping track through the math. Yeah. If I can't be creative, it dies. Right. It, it feels like the complete and just absolute doldrums to me. Yeah. But if I can take someone, like when I work with you, and let's say we work together and I help you with some business advice and your business grows, uh, I don't even get paid. And I'm like, yes, yeah. I won. I made, I made the world a better place. What I started to measure success by was happiness. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you, you've touched on an important thing. Um, especially if you're going to grow a business, you want to take a business. You know, yeah, if, you're, if you just need some extra money to pay some bills, do some stuff, yeah, you, you're going to be focused on, okay, how much money can I make? But when you really want to build that business, you want either it's a lifestyle, you want the creativity, whatever it is that you're trying to get to that happiness factor, you have to figure that out and then go after it. And it, and like you said, and what I find is the people who make the most money, who are the happiest, who have the life that they're really happy with, is because they're following their passion. 
Now, I would like to caution. If your passion is underwater basket weaving, please make sure you know how you're going to make that pay. Okay? If you don't, if you don't already have a million dollars, don't go think you're going to go do it. <laughs> you know, and, and live and live off your parents. But you know, the whole point is you got to find something that you're passionate about and pursue it. And because when you're passionate about it, you're going to keep doing what you have to do to make it a success. Yeah. If you're not passionate about it, you're going to hit your first <clears throat> speed bump on the road of life and go, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Nobody nobody makes me get up. Nobody makes me get the equipment. Nobody makes me set up a website, make videos, produce DVDs, write workbooks, teach classes, see the clients, deal with the online scheduler, make the phone calls, send out the emails, yeah. make the connections, set up Facebook ads, find people to hire to help me with tasks. And it's like, why do I do it? And one is because I think that massage and body work makes people feel better. And I think it's a good, worthwhile thing that I'd like more people to experience. And I'd like to be able to make my little niche in the marketplace mm -hmm. expand and grow. There's something about us, for instance, Time Massage Jam. I tell people all the time, Time Massage Jam doesn't break the law, but Time Massage Jam breaks all the rules. Mm -hmm. When massage therapists would come in and say, well, these people, these people aren't licensed. And I was like, oh yeah, no, it's a, it's a public event. They're like, but they don't know contraindications. Nobody's ever been injured at a time massage jam. Right. But in their mind, you only give, you don't, massage is only for the people who are licensed. Right. And I'm like, no, the, the massage is only for massage therapists who can charge for the service. If I'm showing somebody how to work on their loved one or work on their family and friends, that's free. Right. Because massage therapists don't own massage, they own the capacity to be able to charge for that service. Exactly, yeah. And the thing is, being able to break the rules and do something new, do something innovative, that just kind of threw a monkey wrench in people's preconceived notions, mm -hmm. gets me off. There's <laughs> something about you are a being a troublemaker. Yeah but doing something good. It was like being a troublemaker that saw that your na the elderly neighbor's fence was busted and you got together with your friends and started whitewashing the fence. Mm -hmm. And then all your friends go, man, that looks like it's fun. And by the time you're done, the lady's fence is repaired. Yeah. That concept is what Time Massage Jam is to me. Mm -hmm. And it's why I continue to put out time and energy because it does help with my business but it gives something back to the community. And when people tie into that, they have a weird sense, because here's what they do. They look across the spectrum of businesses, and all these massage therapists are going, buy, 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 buy. And they look at me, and this guy, one guy says, give. And they're like, what is he doing? They pay attention to that, because that stands out. They're like, so I can come to this event and it costs $10 and you're going to teach me some time massage and give me some time massage? Sure. That's what stands out. Yeah. You have to do something different. The measure of success is to me a moving target. Because mm -hmm. what, what you find successful right now might not be what you think is success yeah. in five years. Yeah, as you move on, you develop, you know, there, there's new things that that you go, oh, wow, yeah, I want to be able to do that. Or, oh, wow, if I could create this on top of what I, oh, yeah, that's what I need to do. And, and then that keeps you moving because you're like, okay, i got a new target to go after. And, yeah. and, and it's interesting. You're talking about, you know, you, I think you were a born troublemaker, apparently. <laughs> According to my mother and father, yes, indeed. <laughs> now, my mother might say I've been a bit of a troublemaker, but, you know, to be honest with you, I think I have an inner troublemaker, and I've, I've always been more of the conformist, you know, it's like, do what you're supposed to do, go, you know, follow the directions, and, I mean, I am a, I've always been a very good employee, but you know what's happened over the last five years? I'm almost unemployable now. Because I can't stay working for somebody else. And I am learning how to unleash my inner troublemaker and trying to get my mind thinking, okay, what's going to turn something on its head? How am I going to break this mold that I've been in? So I think 
whether you're born to it or whether you just have a desire to do something, you can cultivate that in yourself as well. If you're willing to, there was, I was watching this video, a guy was giving a speech on how to start a movement. <clears throat> and he had a video, and I guess it was taken at an outdoor music festival or something. And at the beginning of it, you know, everybody's sitting down on the grass listening to the music, and there's one guy off in the corner dancing like a maniac, right? I mean, it's just, you're like, everybody's like, oh my gosh, you know, if, if you knew him, you're like, okay, I don't know Bob, I don't know what Bob's doing. But after a few minutes, somebody joins him and starts dancing like a maniac. A few minutes later, a couple more people, and, and by the time it's over, all these people are dancing like maniacs. And so I think to some degree, you, you know, if you want to achieve success and whatever, however you define that, to some degree, you're going to be, you're going to have to be that maniac who starts the dance and then get people to follow you. Yeah. And I think you, you already have a good group of people who are following you. I'm still dancing alone. Uh, <laughs> for some yeah, of my you stuff. Have, you have uh, uh, contractors who work with you. Yeah. I mean, for my, the massage side, yeah, I'm definitely, you know, I, I've started that following for sure. And building a following also, we talked about organic, and I, I make this um, analogy, not analogy, I make this symbolic representation regularly where there's organic stuff and digital stuff. Mm -hmm. And the Time Massage mm -hmm. Jam is very much an organic thing now because we get to work in person. But it becomes digital when it's online. Yeah. So I think you have more of an organic following at this point. You don't have as much of a digital following. Right. Yet. Yeah. yeah. But you can build that. That's not. Yeah. Easy. yeah. I think the organic is more challenging. That's more. Um, okay. So like I made a free workbook. That free workbook, you know, within the first like six months, it was up two thousand people downloaded. Mm. On the one hand, you could say I built a following, but th those people don't necessarily buy stuff. They just download right. a free workbook and never remove themselves from my email list. Right. So it just depends on the kind of following that you're trying to build yeah. <clears throat> and what you're trying to do. There are sometimes unintended consequences for making various business choices, but I don't have fear in trying something new. If, if I'm, because I'm always looking for the edges, and I look for the edges to the point where I had to get a lawyer, and when I talk to a lawyer about a trademark for Time Massage Jam and you know, intellectual property things that I'm not aware of, you wind up having these conversations where you sit back, you look at your lawyer, and you go, what can I get away with? And it's not because I'm trying to, to break the law, it's because I don't know the law. I know business. And when I'm looking at business, I'm looking for an edge. Mm -hmm. And then that's when the lawyer says, oh, wait, no, can't do that. That's illegal. Oh, no, can't start a franchise. You don't have enough money for a franchise. There's a lot more paperwork and baggage involved in that than you're prepared to deal with. Then he's like, okay, no, here's a nice, okay, I see what you're trying to do. This is a nice, you need a trademark for Time Massage Jam. Right. And then you start to think in terms of scale. People who come to the Time Massage Jam in Austin think of it as a small provincial event made up of our local community. Mm -hmm. What they don't realize is I'm sitting on the back end going, okay, I've almost got enough money for the website. Now can we scale Time Massage Jam and have 100 chapters across the United States? Right. They don't see it yet, but that's right. the thing. It transforms because I'm always thinking 10 steps ahead. Exactly. Because I'm yeah. like, where are we going? Because me shooting videos today is another step in me walking wherever it is I'm heading. Yeah. And I'm also not afraid for it to fail. Right. And that, that's another thing, and I think a lot of people, especially in our culture and our society, we're afraid to fail. And I will promise you, I have failed in a lot of stuff, and in fact, <laughs> I have failed big a couple of times. But you know what? I'm still here, and I'm still alive. So failure generally will not kill you. Um, so, and you know, most people, if you fail, will not even remember it ten years down the line. Yeah. And here's the thing, you keep trying, you keep shooting for something, you're going to fail here and there, but you know, you're going to keep moving, you're going to keep making, making progress, and then when you do hit that true success, you've got some great stories to tell people, <laughs> because people always want to hear about how you messed it up when you, when you first started. So, 
It's, um, so don't fear failure, because that's actually where we learn the most. Yeah. I have learned more from my failures than my successes. And that's a really, that's a really challenging thing, because people, for some reason, they want things to be perfect. When people talk about, um, like, uh, Susan Lancaster was asking about your vision of a successful business. Most people think a successful business, you don't fail. Oh no, most, most people who have, who have succeeded have failed at least once in their yeah, lives. Yeah, anybody, any, anybody who's an entrepreneur, not even just a small business owner, yeah. has tried something that didn't work. Yep. And the big difference between somebody who's successful and somebody who's not is they didn't stop. Yeah. So time and size jam falls apart, doesn't work. I'm like, okay. I don't even have any emotional resonance to it. Yeah. It's, it's a weird sort of thing for me because I knew that to put my all into it, I had to believe in it, one. Yeah. And then I had to be willing to let it die. It's kind of like I'm, I'm not much of a, a gardener. Uh, and every time what I do is I get various seeds and seedlings. And because of our Texas climate, I go, good luck. Cross your fingers. <laughs> do we have enough water? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, you throw stuff in the ground and see what works. Mm -hmm. And then you go, radishes, wow. Man, I didn't know radishes were so easy to grow. They work really great in our climate. Then Swiss chard. And then you just keep layering and adding plants season after season where other people go, man, you're an amazing gardener. And it's like, no, this... These are just the 10 plants that survive from the million <laughs> seeds I threw out. You, you didn't see all the deaths that led to the success. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a little dark. <laughs> so, but yeah, and I, I think that's, you know, that is such the key is just keep trying and moving forward. And, you know, it's not easy. Failure, failure for me, some things it's like, yeah, okay, it didn't work out. I'm okay. Um, <laughs> the cookie dragging hit a little bit hard, but that's because I spent, oh boy, did I spend a lot of money on that adventure. Um, but I learned so much, and what I have found is that all my, my years of trying different things, doing different things, and realizing that well, what I realize now is I didn't have a clue what I was doing, and yeah, they failed, that, that's what happens. But then when I got to massage school, and I saw the opportunity, the, the low cost of entry, Trust me, it's a low cost of entry. <laughs> Compared to many other fields. Yeah, well, you know, I, in my massage class, I'd have people, you know, we, when we were look, first looking at massage tables, and they go, oh man, that's a lot of money for a massage table. Something that you're going to have for 20 years, you know, as long as you don't abuse it. And I would look at them and go, have you ever bought a commercial oven? I have. That's cheap, you know. <laughs> so, you know, when, when you have those experiences, it helps you get a better view of what something costs. You know, another example, when I bought my, my massage business from the lady, basically I bought her client list, and she charged me $3,000 for 300 names. Now, with my experience, I was looking at, I go, I think that's pretty good. But I asked a couple people, I'm like, yeah, because when you think of how much money you would have to spend, now, now mind you, not all those 300 names were my, I did not walk into a 300 client business, but you know, I got enough clients that in my first year in business, and it wasn't even a full year, I made all the money back on, that I paid going to massage school, all my supplies, paying wow. for the business, and I had profit left over yeah. in my first less than a year of business. And most businesses, by the way, I, I don't know what the actual statistics are, but a lot of businesses don't make any profit for three or more years. Yeah, it takes several years to really get it up and steady and doing that. So, I mean, so I got very lucky that that opportunity was there, but then it wasn't just luck because then I acted on it because um, I was the first massage therapist she had who actually got to the point where I gave her a massage before she was re ready to give up her list. She wanted to make sure who she was handed over to knew what they were doing. And um, she had people who called her up and thought they were just going to give her, that she was just going to give them their list for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, and when I look, I'm like, $3,000 for 300 names. Yeah, that, that's doable because I knew how much money it was going to cost to well. get each one of those clients. Yeah, if, if it's done well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you got to be careful who you're dealing business with, but this was a lady who had worked for the massage school that I went to.